Peter Singer is probably the world's most controversial philosopher. He coined the phrase animal liberation as a book title, often described as the Bible of the animal rights movement. And he believes the human exploitation of animals is no more justified than the exploitation of other people. But it's Singer's views on abortion and euthanasia that have led to death threats against this soft-spoken Ivy League academic. Peter Singer, the New Yorker magazine has described you as the world's most influential living philosopher. Others take a different view. They have denounced you as the most dangerous man in the world today. It's not often I get a chance to interview the most dangerous man in the world today. But that's because of the views that you have articulated, views which I expect have brought some danger to you personally and in terms of your freedom to express those views. Ah, some, I guess. I mean, I think the most dangerous man stuff is, is ridiculous. And actually, since 9-11, uh, people have stopped talking about it. I, mean, I guess bin Laden is, has edged ahead of me, you could say. Um, as far as personal security is concerned, I was uh, somewhat concerned when I, when I came to Princeton because uh, I did get death threats. Um, and it's known that uh, members of the anti-abortion movement had murdered uh, doctors and firebombed uh, clinics that were doing abortions. Uh, one of the people who was suspected, subsequently convicted of, of uh, shooting a, a doctor who carried out abortions with a high-powered rifle, um, was still at large. So, yes, I had to be somewhat worried about that, but I didn't really see that I had much choice either. I had to still go on with my life. We'll come to that particularly controversial view which prompts some of the, that reaction to you in a moment but I want to start with your views on animals um, where you began to make your rep reputation internationally in the 1970s you're probably the most famous vegetarian in the world uh, you are the the author of a book animal liberation which is often described as the Bible of the animal welfare movement what made you a vegetarian I became a vegetarian because I started thinking about the ethical question of whether we're entitled to treat animals as we do when we raise them on farms, which nowadays, of course, are overwhelmingly intensive factory farms, and slaughter them and, and turn them into food. Uh, I was challenged to think about that by simply having lunch with someone who was a vegetarian when I was a graduate student at Oxford. Uh, that led me to think about the issue, to start reading about it. I hadn't known much about factory farming, for instance. Uh, this is in the early 1970s. Um, and uh, although at first I tried to find ways of defending and justifying uh, a subordinate status for, mo for animals so that we're entitled to, to treat them the way we did, in the end I came to think that, that you can't, that it's all kind of a prejudice, uh, speciesism, that we think that our species is superior just because we're human to, to them and that therefore we're entitled to use them as means to our ends, as, as uh, Kant, for example, an 18th century German philosopher said. Um, but, but there's really no philosophical principle on which you can ground the idea that they're just things. I mean, obviously they're, they're sentient beings. They can suffer. They can feel pain. Um, their interests should count. So that's why I think there are differences in the wrongness of killing. Um, and why I don't object to killing animals as such, uh, but I do object to inflicting suffering on them as if such. If we could humanely, painlessly kill an animal and, and use, slaughter that animal and, and, and use its meat within uh, the food industry, would that be morally legitimate? Well, I mean, I would have uh, far fewer objections to that than I do to current practices. Uh, if animals really had you know, good lives, um, what they need in terms of their biological, physical needs, also their social needs and emotional needs, because if we're talking about birds and mammals, they certainly have social and emotional lives. Um, and if you know, all that happened was that they were then painlessly killed prematurely, um, I would be less troubled by, by that. Um, then might, you might still want to ask other questions as to why this was necessary, given that we can nourish ourselves well without doing it. But, um, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm certainly prepared to debate. Is animal experimentation ever legitimate? The, the question should more be about the institution and the practice of animal experimentation as we 
have it uh, today, which I think is premised on the idea that animal interests don't count or don't count very much. And that's really what I'm opposed to, just the idea that you know, you can walk into a lab on Monday morning and say, well, I need 200 rats or uh, 50 rabbits or uh, a dozen monkeys or something to do the research. And although you, know, you may have to go through uh, an ethics committee or a, a review from the Home Office or whatever it might be, um, that review is, is not really based on the idea that the interests of these animals are comparably important to similar interests. Let's come to what is easily the most controversial position you have defended, infanticide, the legitimacy of infanticide, the killing of recently born infants under certain circumstances. Right. What are those circumstances? Well, firstly, um, what I'm saying is that I think that in some cases where infants are born with serious disabilities, the parents and doctors together should be able to choose that the child should not live. And having made that choice, they should be able to make sure that the child then dies swiftly and humanely. Um, and I, I put it that way for two reasons. Firstly, I'm not here to say, you know, this child should live and this child shouldn't. You might have two children with exactly the same disability, one with a family who wants to love and care for that child and do everything possible for it, another with a family who says, look, we think this life is, you know, starting under such poor prospects that we really think it's better that the baby not live and then maybe we'll have another child with better prospects. Um, so I think it's, in, you know, both of those families should be able to make their choices and should be supported by the community and the government with resources to assist the child if they decide that the child should live or permitted to end the child's life humanely if they think it's better the child should not. Up to a certain point in time? Well, I think it's actually hard to draw a cut-off line. Now, that is something where, on which I've changed. Um, uh, Twenty years or so ago, I wrote a book in which my co-author and I suggested a 28-day cut-off, uh, which was based on uh, an ancient Greek uh, ritual that you performed 28 days after birth when you carried the baby around the, the the hearth of the home and you accepted the baby into the community and after that you could no longer expose the baby on the hillside as used to be done with, with disabled babies. Um, so you know we thought well maybe that's a suitable cutoff and that is around the time I think when it's starting to get a bit late because there's usually more bonding between family and child. But, um, but I wouldn't say that you could have a rigid cutoff really I think. Before they're self-aware? Yes, when they're clearly not self-aware. That's important. I think that that's a reasonable way of marking a distinction. Um, obviously, development of self-awareness is gradual, um, and that's why it's hard to find any, any sharp lines. I, I, basically, I would say I think these decisions should be made as soon as possible after birth, as soon as you know, the medical information and the family have had time to assimilate that, maybe to inquire about the condition, uh, perhaps to consult with organizations of people who have that uh, disability or parents of people with children with that disability so that they can really inform themselves properly on the issue. There are other ways of looking at this, of course. Couldn't one say, for example, that personhood or what it is to be a person is a deeply mysterious thing? And although we have no clear definition of that, we can recognize persons when we see them. Peter Singer is a person, Stephen Hawking. Is, is a person. Uh, the deaf Beethoven is a person. A child born with a disability is a person even before 28 days. Well, I think we need to talk about these uh, border cases, if you like, and try and decide if, if, we, if this is a mysterious intuition, how we know. I mean, let's, let's say a child born uh, without a brain, with, with a brain stem, so they're not brain dead, but with nothing more in the brain. So this child will never be able to recognize uh, his or her mother, will never smile at another human being as they come in the room, will never communicate in any way, will not feel anything either. 